If you're a real estate investor or you want to be a real estate investor and you're looking for more money to fund your deals, don't go anywhere because I'm getting ready to plug you into the funding. Well, welcome to the show. My name is Jay Connor. I'm known as the Private Money Authority. And if this is your first time to tune in to Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor, I want to give you a very, very special welcome. Here on the show, we talk about all things real estate investing. We talk about single family houses. We talk about commercial deals. We talk about creative ways to find really, really deeply discounted properties before other real estate investors even know they exist. Uh, as I just mentioned, we talk about how to get your deals funded without relying on traditional banks, without relying on traditional mortgage companies. We talk about how to sell properties quickly, how to automate the business, and how to really achieve true wealth and freedom in this world of real estate investing. Now, on the show, we are, wow, up into over 100 episodes now. Here on the show, I have just amazing guests and experts that join me here on the show. But before I bring my special guest on today, I want to go ahead and give everybody free access to an online class that I just recently produced. It's ready for you to go view and learn from. The name of the class is Where to Get the Money Now. So for that free class, go right here and we're going to put it up on the screen for all of our visual viewers, www.jayconner.com forward slash money podcast, jayconner.com forward slash money podcast. Now, in addition to that, I have a guest and an expert here on the show with me today. Talk about getting funding for your deals and getting money to fund your deals. You are at the right place. So my good friend, my colleague that I have on here, his name is Mike Slotnick. And let me tell you just a little bit about Mike before I bring him on. He's been investing. He's been an equity investor, a debt investor all the way back since 2000. And prior to that, he had nearly 15 years in information technology. He was managing risk and business intelligence and just right, really, really smart stuff that I don't even understand myself. But anyway, while Mike was building this successful career in IT, he's had this passion for real estate investing because quite frankly, he and I, we are into real estate investing because there's this high level of being able to predict the amount of success that we can get when we invest. So way back in 2009, my good friend, Mike, he joined Tempo Funding LLC. And then a little bit later in 2014, he became the CEO of this fund and he's still been growing it ever since. So one thing that sets Mike apart is that he has the opportunity well, really two things. We got uh, Mike is really going to speak. I've got him here on the show for two reasons. Mike is going to be talking to you, whether you're interested in real estate investing from a very passive standpoint to where you can actually be an investor in, in his fund, or if you're looking for funding for your deals as a real estate investor, Mike can also help you as that or help you with that. So I met Mike some time ago. He and I are fellow members of a very, very high-end mastermind group. He's in multiple masterminds and investor mastermind groups. And right before I bring Mike on, I got to tell you, he's got a best-selling book that he's the author of titled How to Choose a Smart Real Estate Investment Fund. And stay on the show all the way to the end, and you're going to find out how you can get a copy of his book as well. I've been a guest on Mike's podcast as well. The name of his podcast that you'll be sure and want to check out. It's titled Big Mike Fund. And y'all can also find him at bigmikefund.com. With that, my good friend, my colleague, expert in funding for real estate investors, Mike Slotnick. Mike, welcome to the show. Hi, Jay. Thank you very much. I, I am humbled by your kind introduction, beyond kind. Make me look like a, a superstar and I'm just down to, to the earth guy. And I appreciate the opportunity to be on your podcast. 
Absolutely, Mike. Well, one thing that I and my audience always like to know before we actually jump into the meat and potatoes as to what you can do for uh, my audience. I know you've been interested in real estate investing for many, many years, but really what was it that got your attention in the, in the first place and got you interested in real estate investing? In 2000, I bought my first property and it was my first home. And, and in New York City, it's never easy or cheap to buy anything. So getting into a property here is expensive. So the opportunity was to, I found an apartment at a good price with a motivated seller. And I didn't think twice about it. I didn't even get a mortgage. I just borrowed money from the family, bought, bought the apartment, and then the journey started. So if you're looking to invest money in real estate, start with your own home. Generally speaking, that's the first step. You get your tax deduction, you get all kinds of benefits from home ownership, and you no longer pay rent. That's what got me started. That's simple. Yeah. Hey, when you were telling that story, it came to my mind, you were borrowing mom and pop money before you even knew what mom and pop money was. That's right. That's, right. That's exactly right. I was borrowing, yes, the money from the family members. Uh, that that oh, was, well, got me going. And well, now I call it mom and pop money. And non, it's not, not my phrase, but I certainly use the phrase. Well, I tell you, to tell you the truth, I never heard of mom and pop money as far as that phrase goes until I actually heard you say it. And so anyway, I get that. Well, again, before we jump right in, tell our audience a little bit about yourself and your family. Sure. Uh, I live in Brooklyn, New York, married, four kids and a cat. It's a zoo. I live in a zoo. You live and, in a zoo. Uh, yeah, it's busy. Four kids on the different ages, so it's just a lot of kids' activities. My kids ice skate heavily, and I'm, I live on an ice skating rink. People ask me if I ever ice skate. I, I tell them, you ever been to a circus? You ever seen bears on ice ice skating? That's me. <laughs> but uh, on a serious note, yeah, I, I, I know. I, I, I have my good days and, and bad days uh, not liking New York City. The traffic here is brutal. There's certainly some things I love about the city. But beyond that, I invest. we invest all over the country. We invest broadly from um, single-family portfolios and, and single-family housing to multifamily, to self-storage, to shopping centers, to self-storage facilities, to office buildings. So we got a broad portfolio of investments individually and, and on a fund level. Got you. So you're originally from where and brought, what brought you to the United States? Well, the joke would be like James Bond from Russia would love, but I'm actually not from Russia, from Moldova. Moldova is a republic of the former Soviet Union, but nobody knows what it is. It's the size of a Rhode Island, a little bit bigger. It's a tiny, tiny place, and most people don't know what it is. My native tongue is Russian. I've been here since 89. Soviet Union was still Soviet Union. And I'm a U.S. citizen now. I'm a patriot of the United States. I've lived here ever since that time. And I can tell you, Having moved from a communist socialist country, that system doesn't work. So when I see a lot of socialistic attempts here, I absolutely think it's a bad idea. But let's not start getting into politics. I just think that the U.S. doesn't move in that direction. Let me put it this way. Well, I can tell you, you're okay to say what you believe because the majority of my audience is going to agree with you, I can assure you. So anyway, Mike, you know, You've got an investment fund that's very, very successful that gives your investors a really, really good, good rate of return. You also have funding for real estate investors that want to do deals. So, you know, markets change. I mean, you know, what was going on two or three years ago is not exactly what's going on today. So what would you say? What's going on in real estate from your perspective right now? What's hot? What are the good opportunities? Sure. So we, we've certainly had a great run for many years since the Great Recession. It's been a great recovery. And a lot of prices have appreciated quite a bit. So finding bargains is a lot harder now. Before you could get a great short sale, the banks were giving away the farm. Today, you have to earn the farm. And uh, what still works pretty well, typically affordable housing. So the entry level, if you're buying, let's use an example, there's a term used turnkey. I'm sure the audience knows what it is. It's an affordable property that can be used as, as an investment acquisition. And you could uh, rent it out and keep it for long term. It's a good income producing property. 
that market seems to be very stable. It doesn't seem to drop. There's still a good amount of new construction and investing in that sector today is still solid investment with good downside protection. What is softened up quite a bit is high-end stuff in many, many markets in the residential space. So we're talking about, it all depends on the market. In New York City, a million dollars may, may, may be the entry level, but somewhere else, New York, a million bucks might be a massive luxury. So demand for the, those type of properties softened up. And uh, if you're looking to invest, depending on what you're doing, obviously you're not going to get a good yield out of high-end properties, but you will get a good yield out of residential properties. I see plenty of other opportunities. We invest on a fund level into many things. So one thing I do like in New York City, instead of buying or building new buildings, we buy firstly in mortgages defaulted on term. So that sector I like quite a bit. Imagine somebody builds new condos and it takes them longer than expected and the bank wants to sell the paper. You could buy the paper and file notice of default, have a very low to value ratio and have a strong return because of the default interest rate could be high. Those are very defensive investments because you're basically buying first lien mortgage and I like that sector. I like contrarian plays or value investing in today's market. What, what is that? And that is, we've all seen the Amazon effect, right? Amazon is eating everybody's lunch. But at the same time, the world is not ending in retail space. In fact, retail space is on a huge discount, great real estate. You're buying buildings well below reconstruction cost, and you can buy them at great prices. So we're investing in, in some of those deals. Opportunistically, they generate strong cash flow. And it's really hard to believe that they could possibly fall in price further. As long as the economy is there, as long as people need to get a haircut, they need to go to a dentist, they need to go to a doctor, they need to go to the gym, that stuff, the service-oriented businesses will be around for a long time. So these are a couple of areas of opportunities that I see. There are others, but uh, those are kind of directionally big areas. Talking about retail is another very interesting area of opportunity. When big bucks... Retailers fail. Sears, Macy's, JCPenney, and they close a store. That store could be well positioned within the city, but it no longer works as a department store. So conversions to self-storage facilities often become the next trend and the next opportunity. So I hope it's not too many things, but I, I gave you kind of three different flavors. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting that you say that, you know, those those vacant Commercial properties, the big box stores can a lot of times be converted into self-storage. Would you say that self-storage, the business is on the rise or would you say it's stable? Well, the number of conversions have been high. So from the creation of supply, creation of these new facilities, so there's been new construction going on, also has been a lot of conversions. So the market has been taking a lot of new supply. The demand has been stable and growing, and it's expected to actually accelerate during a recession. So you can't go in blindly. You can go buy a facility and there's competition, strong competition in the area, you might wind up with a bad asset. But if you choose your battles carefully and you wind up with a good facility, it's generally very, very steady business. The people's propensity to stay is very high. In other words, if they're paying 90 bucks a month and you raise their rent to 100 bucks a month, Will they move? Highly unlikely. So they they are very sticky customers, and people store their junk. If you're in a certain area, <laughs> right? I mean, they gotta put their junk somewhere. That's why I like the sector. The sector, no tenants and toilets, and it's generally pretty predictable. But it is an operating business. You gotta have a good oper- uh, good operation. So you see the difference between. Strong self-storage facility and the bad ones is the management. If you have a good management, you can make a big difference. Marketing, just operations, ability to generate fee income, and so on. Yeah. Well, there's no question that interest rates are finally on the rise. No question. Interest rates are rising. So with that being the case, what do you think is going to be the effect on real estate assets with the rising interest rates. And what do you think rising interest rates, what kind of effect do you think that's going to have on the real estate investor? So let me answer the questions two ways. Yes, the rates have been rising, but they they appear to have stopped. 
right? We, we've seen this. They, they were rising, 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 rising. And then the Fed decided they got a little nervous. And that's the good news for the real estate investors. Because rising interest rates typically increase the cost of financing. And real estate is very sensitive to the cost of financing. Because people buy leverage. They get a mortgage, they put 25% down, 75% from the bank. As the rates go up, so the cost of the, of the financing goes up. So rising interest rates have had a negative effect on real estate market and the prices. Recently, again, we're talking about number of the last, say, three, four months. The rates have slowed down. The economy has been showing signs of concern, and Fed decided to slow down interest rate increases. And the 10-year Treasury has also has come down. And that's a good news because the cost of financing have come down. So in a, on a long-term basis, I'm actually a proponent of a grand conspiracy theory that the U.S. government cannot afford high interest rates. So they'll do everything in their power to move towards the Japan model. So having interest rates very low so that they can, politicians can comfortably run big deficits in the budget, keep borrowing money. And if your interest rates are lower and lower in the debt, you can keep blowing the thing up until the cows come home. <laughs> well, as I say, eventually the piper will get paid, right? For sure. All right, so- eventually, they're going to cause inflation. That's eventually what they're doing. Everything is going to be more expensive, but the money will be less valuable. So in theory, when you have inflation, it's supposed to have high interest rates. In practice, they're going to keep the rates low. We're still going to have the street level inflation. And they're going right. to manipulate CPI so that they don't have to pay increased social security checks too much. So that's the game. That's the name of the game for the government. There you go. All right. So I got a big question for you, Mike. And this question I know our audience wants to hear and needs to know your answers. So here's, let me set it up. So let's talk about private lenders or individuals that passively invest or loan their money out to real estate investors or invest into a fund. So, you know, my my audience knows me as the private money guy. So we use a lot of mom and pop money. So, so you've got that one model to where an individual or individuals will loan their money on one piece of real estate. And then we have your fund to where people are actually investing into a fund. Let's assume, now I know my audience is very savvy and smart. Let's assume some of the audience though doesn't know any difference between how does that work on investing in just a particular property or loaning money, if you will, on a particular property versus investing in a fund like Tempo Fund Walk us through what's the difference and what's the advantages, say, of investing in your fund? Sure, Jason. Great question. I appreciate it very much. So let me answer the question, just to go back to the basics. So you could loan money on a property or you could buy a property. You could be an owner on a property or a lender on a property. Or you could invest in a fund. Our fund, both. We actually loan the money on properties. So we do these loans. We also own properties. So the the major difference between a single investment and a fund is that when you make a single investment, you have one asset. So if you make a loan, you have one collateral. You record a mortgage or a deed of trust, a single property, and that is your collateral. If the borrower doesn't pay, you could foreclose on a property and then sell it to recover your money. You put your money in the fund, there is no direct collateral. It's a little bit of a scary thing. So when when, when you put the money in the fund, you don't have any direct collateral. You don't know where is your money going. But what's happening with the fund is all that money is pooled with many other investors. And the fund collectively owns all these mortgages or all these investments. So you're secured by real estate, except for you don't own investments directly. So think of it this way. One property, one investor, that's direct. You have many investors in a fund. And then you have many investments from the fund into many assets. It's a many-to-many relationship. Fund acts as a diversification vehicle. So one of the main benefits of a fund is diversification. You spread the risk among many projects. Imagine you put the money on one loan, 100,000 bucks, and that loan goes bad. And you start pulling your hair out. You got to foreclose. You got to deal with all the problems. And the borrower is not responding. And the lawyer is costing you money. It's aggravation. On the other hand, you put the money in the fund, and you're completely passive. So another benefit, you don't have to deal with real estate problems directly. 
is diversification. It's a passive investment. The fund also could have other benefits that are in straight investment pr produces. For example, if you get depreciation, if you own a property, you would get depreciation as a pass through on a fund level. If you get income on individual property, the same way the fund passes through income. So it's a, it's a much more elegant vehicle. There's other interesting differences. So for example, if you are trying to make an investment, you need the right amount of money, whatever it is, if it's a loan or an acquisition, you need the right amount of money, not more, not less. It's what's needed for that project. When you put the money in the fund, you can put a certain amount and it's flexible. You can add more. You can take some money back out and, and keep reinvesting distributions. You have a lot of flexibility from that perspective. Does it make sense? Yes. Excellent. Excellent answer. That really gives a nice overview as to the differences between doing one, you know, uh, and loaning money on one property versus the diversification. So that's, that's excellent. Now, let me ask you this question, Mike. Now, I know, <laughs> I know this is sort of going to be like asking a fisherman if his fish are fresh. So I, I, <laughs> I, I, I get that. But, but I'm, I'm going to ask anyway, because a lot of my audience is really not familiar with you know, funds like you have. So I got, I got a two-part question. The first part is, if someone has never invested in a fund like yours, then what types of questions should they ask the fund manager or the representative of that fund to, in order to be educated as to, is this a fund that I should really consider investing in? So what's the criteria of what makes a fund really a stable fund to invest in if they've never invested before. The second part of the question is, when someone invests, are they able to get returns on a regular basis, a monthly, quarterly, semi-annual, annual, or do they have to wait a certain period of time, or how often can they you know, get, get, make income off of their investment? Jay, these are great questions. I'm, I'm laughing because these questions are answered in the book. And, and he, this is the book. It's, it, it's available on Amazon.com. And I'll make it, this as a gift to folks who are current investors. If, if they'd love to read a physical copy or if they email me, I could get them an electronic copy. So some of the, you ask one of the questions. And then one of the questions you ask is, does the fund pay distributions and how often? That's a very important question. Because some, some funds uh, have a long-term strategy. They go acquire assets for a long time, and then they don't have any distributions until these assets go through their life cycle. Whatever the life cycle is, sometimes it's an acquisition of land, construction of new building, or, or sometimes it's just they taking apartments and improving them and then selling them. So depending on the fund, so one of the key questions to ask is what is the fund strategy? What does the fund do? What is it investing? Uh, understand, invest in what you understand. So if the fund is investing into some very speculative ground up construction projects, and most of what the fund does is that, that's a high risk investment. And you will have no cash flow until these buildings are built. And then there are funds like ours. We are income and growth fund. We generate good amount of income on quarterly distributions, but we also have strategy to generate growth through the value add on these projects. So these are some of the questions. Obviously, ask the question about the experience of the manager. How long have they been doing it? What's been their track record? How robust is the team? What type of assets they invest in? In addition, you, you obviously can ask, what's the minimum investment? Are there different type of shares of the fund? Is there a preferred return in the fund? A lot of them are in the book. I don't want to take a whole hour talking about these questions, but that's why I wrote this book, is to help folks understand. And then you started the whole discussion with folks not investing in the past. Well, I would say, have you ever invested on a Wall Street into anything? Have you invested into any real estate through the Wall Street vehicles? I'm not advocating Wall Street. I believe we have much better approach and much more, a much more elegant vehicle than the Wall Street. But the Wall Street does have real estate investment trusts. They're called REITs. And it's publicly traded security. You could buy and it, it's an office REIT or a multifamily REIT. And then they mimic, they have a broad portfolio of office properties or multifamily properties. I'm not saying those are good or bad investments. I'm just saying it's, it's a fund. They function as a fund. We also function as a fund, except for we're not publicly traded. We're privately traded. 
and there are advantages and disadvantages uh, from that perspective. For example, it's one of the questions to ask, how long are the money locked in? When you put your money in, when can you take it out? We have a two year lock in because it's a private fund. And we, we keep the money for two years. We don't want investors who want to put the money for three months and get out. It doesn't work with it for us because we make long-term investments and some short-term. REIT works differently. You buy a stock. The next day you want to get out, you sell the stock. That's it. There's a big difference between liquidity. But one of the key questions of the fund manager to ask is what is their liquidity? So what assets do they have in the fund? And do they have easy liquidity? So th these questions help investors kind of understand is that the fund right for them or not, but they should probably just get a little bit of education and understand what are the publicly traded funds. And they, they have plenty of weaknesses too. One of the primary weaknesses of these big funds, they're humongous and their portfolio is already fully appreciated and they have a very difficult time executing on value add projects. They can't really value add. They're, they, they're, they're there to generate the income and that's about it. We can generate stronger level of income again the, you know, the market conditions and so on. I, I don't know what the future holds. But in general, our target is to generate better than the Wall Street distributions plus appreciation well above the Wall Street. That, that's, that's, our, that's our vision. Excellent, excellent. All right, so my next question, Mike, and um, I can't believe how fast the time is going by. We're getting near to the end of the show. But I got a very broad question for you. So apologize for hitting you from the side here, but a very broad question. And that is, if you had to boil it all down, what's the absolute best investment advice you got? That's a great question. I would say, just do it. That's the best advice. Don't worry about perfection. There's a theory, ready, aim, fire. I follow the, the, the theory ready, fire, aim. Not to make the investments just as a knee-jerk reaction. We do plenty of due diligence. But you have to make investments and you have to learn as you do it. So whatever, whatever your, your philosophy is, don't worry too much about making a perfect investment. Find a good deal. Make sure you understand that's a good deal. And if it's a good deal, do it. Learn along the way and then do the next one. And then do the next one. You're building experience. You're building relationships. You're building track record. So that's my advice is, is be action oriented rather than perfection oriented. Yeah. I didn't know what your answer was going to be, but I shouldn't be surprised because what I've discovered and observed over the past 15 years that I've been a real estate investor myself, and I'm, I'm a private lender and an investor as well. But what I've discovered is whether you're a real estate investor or you're a lender or you're investing in a fund, the one attribute that sets apart those that are successful in making money and those that aren't is actually pulling the trigger. And actually, as you said, taking action. As you said, that doesn't mean don't do your research. That doesn't mean don't get educated. That doesn't mean you know, don't make a calculated decision. But what it does mean is what's going to set everybody apart from actually getting the, you can't make a return on investment until you invest, right? That's right. <laughs> and and there's, a, there's a great question that I ask folks and, and that, will, that will summarize the essence of, of this. Are you learning to invest or are you investing to learn? You need to do both, right? Be, be, you, you basically, as you make investments, you're learning, and as you are learning, you're making investments, and that's the that's the crux of it. Nothing is perfect. If you if you if you're gonna look for perfection, you're gonna sit in your hands for a long, long time. That's the bottom line. So, I agree with you, Mike. And you, like other successful business entrepreneurs, you can pretty much judge somebody by who they hang around. You can also judge somebody by the kind of books they read. What book have you read recently or any time that you'd really recommend to, to our audience? Recently, I read this book called Extreme Ownership. I like the book very much. It's written by a couple of Navy SEALs with their experience from combat zones and really, really tough situations. And it's all about extreme ownership. It's about, it, it's, a, it's a path to great leadership. It, it's a book for leaders that helps leaders 
do the right thing, treat their teams well, motivate their teams to do their best through various techniques of leadership. So that's the book, Extreme Ownership. Excellent, excellent. All right, Mike. Well, let me ask you this. I know we are, a lot of our audience is going to want to continue the conversation. They're going to, want to be in uh, contact with you. I know they, they want to get a copy of your book. So let everybody know, and we'll put it in the show notes. We'll also put it up here for those that are watching uh, on the video. How can people contact you, and, and how can they get a copy of the book? Sure. So one of the ways to find me is the bigmikefund.com. It's the podcast page, but that's our primary business. It'll URL forward to the, uh, to the page. Folks can find me by emailing me, mike at templefunding.com. Temple from the word temporary, templefunding.com. I will email them an electronic copy. That doesn't cost me any money. I'm happy to send a physical copy. If you're an accredited investor and you're interested in the fund, I'm happy to share the book. I don't necessarily need your money, but we charge it's on Amazon and it's it's seven ninety five on Amazon plus shipping. So <laughs> I, I, I print this book so or Amazon prints them. I don't even know how they get printed, but there is a physical cost. <laughs> So happy to share it. If you're an accredited investor, we will get you the book. If you're not not accredited, just uh, email me. I'll send you an e-copy. All right. That's excellent. Okay, everybody, to connect with Mike Zlotnick, you can go to his website, www.bigmikefund, B-I-G-M-I-K-E-F-U-N-D.com. And you can also email him at, what's that email address? One more time, Mike. Mike at templefunding.com from the so word Mike, T-M-P-O funding.com. Excellent. Be sure and subscribe to his podcast. He's got an excellent podcast and he has excellent guests on his podcast. Including too, I you. Must say. Including you. I appreciate Jay. <laughs> you can check out Mike's podcast. Uh, find him on iTunes at uh, Big Mike fun is the name of his podcast and again take advantage of his book how to choose a smart real estate investment fund mike thank you so much for taking the time to join us and your final parting comments it's a privilege to serve you all right thank you so much mike i look forward to seeing you at our upcoming uh, mastermind group and everybody thank you so much for joining in here on the show i'm jay connor the private money authority And here's to taking your real estate investing business to the next level. Bye-bye.